23. Let's listen for the word of the Lord. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field, but for the man there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I am fascinated by this passage of Scripture because I believe it teaches us so much about who we are and about who God is in such a short, concise quip. I believe that far too often we kind of skim through this portion of Genesis so we can get to the part where we you know, eat of the fruit and you know, rebel against God and all that sin stuff. But I believe that for us to miss this portion of Genesis would be a grave danger because God teaches us so much in this passage here between his conversation between he and Adam. But Leading up to our passage, what we see is that God has taken Adam and created him out of the very dust of the ground. We can hear echoes back to the beginning of Lent and Ash Wednesday when we proclaim that from dust we came. God takes from the dust and breathes into it the very breath of life. And from that comes Adam and he discovers life upon the earth. And after that, we see that it is time to get to work. That Adam and God begin working together, ordering the life of creation. And our episode picks up with God having Adam go through the arduous task of examining and naming all the animals, all the birds, all the living creatures. Can you imagine having this job? This has got to be crazy. You got like a Mardi Gras parade of animals just coming before you. And it's just you by yourself. And you're like, orange, black stripes, a tiger. Okay, next one. Uh, Big wings, big, big uh, heron. Okay, great. And over and over. And then finally, we start getting things like hippopotamus. And I'm thinking at this point, Adam is just exasperated. He's just, hippopotamus. Like he just takes a deep breath and it sounds like hippopotamus. That's what we get. Can you imagine having this task all by yourself? Eventually, you're just like, God, you know what? Just take it. I don't care. You know, red bird, blue bird, I don't care. <laughs> but among all of these animals, every creature, there was nothing like Adam, nothing to bring him companionship, friendship, relationship. And remember now, at this time, God and Adam were in an unhindered, unblemished, perfect relationship. They were in conversation with each other. They were cooperating and managing the creation. However, God was not like Adam, nor was Adam like God. And in God's infinite wisdom, he sees this as a concern. Up to this point in the creation story, we hear that the sun and the moon and the stars and the animals and the rivers, that God calls all of these things not just good, but God calls them very good. But this man, Adam, he was experiencing something that for the first time God calls not good. Something that needed to be repaired. Adam was in absolute solitude. Utter aloneness. Imagine not having access to another human being. Not just a temporary isolation. But what to this point in your life has been an utter absence of relationship with another person like yourself. I couldn't do this. Before Caroline and I got married, I lived in a one-bedroom apartment by myself, and I couldn't I'd just be having a conversation with myself. I, couldn't, I just couldn't be in silence. I had to have something going on. So whether you're like me or whether you're the most extreme introvert, I think even you can relate to the sense of despair and loneliness that Adam must have known in this solitude. But... Because what was not good could be controlled through the action of God. 
in God's love, He graciously gives Adam the gift of all gifts. He gives Adam a friend, a companion, a community. Listen to Adam's words of praise. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. No longer does he have to search high and low for something that isn't there, but God has created for him the companion, the gift that he needed and given to him from the very hand of God. Adam is given the gift of community. Now conversations can happen. Laughter can be shared. Stories can be told. Life can be experienced. Of course, this passage is used often to reveal the oneness of marriage and the relationship between the man and the woman to complement each other and their humanity. But I believe that that would be far too simple a reading of this passage. I believe that this gift of the other is the teaching of the gift for the community beyond simply the covenant of marriage, but the central need that all of us have as humans to be cared for and loved by another. To know and be known and to see and be seen. In 2004, my family and I, we moved to Gulf Shores, Alabama. Up to that point, we had lived in a small town in North Alabama for 15 years. And so we moved on August the 1st, 2004 to Gulf Shores, Alabama. And on August the 10th, I started my first day of 10th grade. I walked into the doors of Gulf Shores High School, go Dolphins, and... uh, I walked into those doors for the first time, and I didn't know a soul. I didn't know a teacher. I didn't know a coach. I didn't know another student. I mean, absolutely nobody. I was a stranger in a foreign land. And I'll never forget what it felt like to walk into that hallway full of people. And those 30 painstaking minutes before the class, before the doors opened to go to our first classes, I'll never forget not one person looking at me, not one person coming up to talk to me, but just being in a room full of people and being utterly alone. It was in that moment that forever was put in my heart the reminder that we all need community. We all need someone to know who we are and also for us to know who they are. Because many of us, too, can find ourselves in those situations where we feel as if we are a stranger in a foreign land. And we just want somebody to love us, to cherish us, and to welcome us into that place. Perhaps you're sitting here this morning, you have that same pit in your stomach that I had in that hallway that morning. That you've walked into this church for the very first time and you wonder, do they even know that I'm here? Does it even matter that I've come to worship today? Or maybe you've been a part of this church for a really long time and you say, you know what, what if I didn't show up for five or six weeks? Would it even matter? Would they even notice that I'm gone? Is coming to worship even important? Well, let me tell you, if you are a guest here today, we see you and we love you and we welcome you in the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. And we hope that this becomes your spiritual home. We would love to connect with you. And if you've been a part of this church for months or years, if this is your church home, we need you. We value you are an important brother and sister in Christ, and you're an important friend for people sitting around you in this church. Because we need to be together for worship. Dudley can put together the best music. David and I can prepare the best sermons. But if nobody shows up, we can't have worship. Worship is a gathering of the people of Christ to come together together and to glorify and to praise Him. Your presence here does make a difference. Now, all of us fall somewhere on the spectrum of extroversion to introversion. So if you're me, you're way over here on the extreme extroversion. So extroverts, woo, over here. All right. Introverts, you're somewhere right about here. Okay? We can still see you. So somewhere, you are on this spectrum of personality. And wherever you fall on that spectrum is a gift. Because that is how God has created you to be the unique individual that you are. One is not better than the other, but that is who God has created you to be. Instill that within your personality. Some of you may find paradise to be in a mountain cabin far removed, no cell service, reading a book. Other of you, some of others of you find paradise to be in the center of a room entertaining and making people laugh. 
But regardless of where you fall on that spectrum, one thing is abundantly clear throughout God's holy scriptures. You are made to be in relationship with other people. Isolation in the Bible is never seen as a place to be lived in permanently. It's never seen as the ideal or the will of God. We do see people going away for short periods of isolation or short periods of solitude, but only for a brief time of prayer and spiritual growth and meditation, but they always return to the community. No person, no prophet, no teacher, no follower of God throughout the Old or the New Testament is shown to be confined to isolation, to be shown that that is where they are to thrive and grow. From God's gift to Adam in the person of Eve and the garden through Paul's instructions to the churches throughout Asia Minor, community is imprinted upon you. It's shown to be central to your survival and our growth as children of God. Now, I'm not saying you need to leave and go out of here and just find a group of 50 people and just get in the middle of it or go find 15 best friends. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am inviting you to discover is your need to be in a thriving community, but also to be one offering community to other people. What does it say to you and me that God was in a perfect relationship with Adam and Adam in a perfect relationship with God And God, not Adam, God declared that not to be all that Adam needed. That Adam needed more than that to discover his purpose and his potential in life. Even as one created in the very image of God. This has been the question that I have continually asked myself as I've read this passage over many years. Even walking in the garden with God was not enough for Adam in God's eyes. In light of that, how important, how critical must this role of community be in the flourishing of the earth that God saw its absence as to be something that was not good? As a pastor, I'll have people, especially in today's culture, which, by the way, we live in one of the most individualistic cultures in world history. Never around the world has a culture ever been so interested in the fulfillment and the happiness of the individual. We live in an absolutely me-centric culture. That's why there's 8 billion shows on Netflix, because they're trying to create the one that is just for you. It's all about you and your your fulfillment and your happiness and what speaks to you individually. Why pay taxes for schools? I don't have kids. I don't care if they get educated. Why pay for Medicare? I'm not old. I'm happy and I'm young and healthy. See, it's all about what is best for me. Forget what anybody else thinks or how anybody else lives. If I'm happy, if I'm fed, if I'm clothed, then everyone else forget about it. Well, friends, that's not the witness of Scripture. God is not just concerned with the individual. God is concerned with both the individual and the whole. But they'll say, Pastor, why do I need to be in community? Me and Jesus, we got a good thing going. I've got Jesus in my heart. I can can pray to Jesus. I can, you know what, Pastor, I meet Jesus in the deer stand. And that is just a, a holy place. Well, you know what you can't do in the deer stand? You can't be worshiping with your brothers and sisters in the faith. Throughout the four Gospels, Jesus himself makes a point in his ministry to stop and to worship in the synagogues. Friends, if Jesus Christ needed to be in communal worship, if he made that a priority in his time here on earth, how much more so ought we to take that time to be in worship together? Without a doubt, it is important to have Jesus in your heart, but that is not the end-all, be-all. If the only thing that was important was for you to have Jesus in your heart, then none of us would be here because it would have been just enough for Adam. But God saw that we needed something more. Your relationship with God is not just about having Jesus in your heart. But it's about taking that love that he has placed within your soul and cultivating that love, cultivating that relationship and following Jesus within the support and the sustaining of a community. Yes, Jesus undoubtedly died on the cross for your individual sin. But Jesus Christ also gave his life for the sins of the world. And yes, Jesus has saved you 
personally. But Jesus has not saved you for you only. Jesus founded the church because he knew. He knew in his divine wisdom that you and I would need a place to come together to worship and to pray and to be in relationship with one another. God sees our need for belonging and has given us not only the gifts of friendship and parents and siblings and spouses, but he has given us the belonging place of the church. If you feel left out, if you feel as if you don't belong, God has created this place where every person is welcomed and acknowledged and affirmed as a child of Almighty God. But when you join the community of faith, when you accept that gift of grace and allow Jesus Christ to dwell in your heart, and you begin following him, you now have a very particular responsibility. This new life that you have been given is not a gift for you to hoard. It's not for you to take the light and put it under the bushel basket. It's not for you to take your talent and bury it in the dirt. Rather, you are to take this gift and be extravagant with it. To take it and throw it as far as you can in the community and take that gift and share it. Do you see this beautiful logo behind me that was put together by Tina Wilson and Holly Ty? I love this logo. It's one of my, the favorite logos that we've done. I love maps. But I love this because we see the circle at the top left. And then that very big circle is a smaller circle where we live, where God has brought together you and I in this year, in this church, in this day for a very specific purpose. He's brought us from all corners of the earth. Some of you have lived as far away as Paris. Perhaps you've come down from Michigan, or perhaps you live just across the bridge in Lillian. But for whatever reason, God has brought us together from all of our places of work, all of our homes, all of our families of origin to this place for a specific purpose, for this community, for the kingdom of God. And we call ourselves a community because we are called to go forth and bless this community. And I call it a community because I don't really think this is even like a city. Like, we're not West Pensacola. We're not even like Perdido Key because the key's on the other side of the bridge. But this is Interarity, but I don't live on Interarity. I live off of Bower. So we are just kind of a community within a community. We have a job to do all throughout this area where we live. This message that I'm preaching right now rings hollow. Why? Because people just a half a mile, two miles from these very doors are living lives of isolation beyond comprehension. They wake up every day and say, if I died today, would anybody even notice? If I disappeared, would people realize that I'm even absent? They are living in a state of isolation, a state of sadness, a state of utter solitude beyond anything any of us perhaps have ever experienced. You may pass by them in public, and they may be surrounded by people every day, but yet they feel utterly alone. And all they want is for someone to acknowledge that they exist, to show them the simple grace of friendship, Community is not simply a gift or a need, but community is our mission. How many people are withering in silence because they've been forgotten, pushed away, or written off? How many people are desiring just to have the simple gift of conversation? Building community and helping people experience the love of Jesus Christ that has culminated in the church is the greatest gift that we can give the community in which we live. It's because of what God did in the garden that you and I have the commandment to go out of these doors and to expand this community, to include every person who needs to know the life-giving power of the community of Jesus Christ. If you are worshiping here today and you feel alone and forgotten, if you are here and need a place to belong, if you need people to know you, to be your friend, to be a brother or sister in Christ, then hear the good news. Welcome home. We want to be your family. We want to be your community. We want to be your place of relationship and friendship. 
But perhaps you have friends, you have family, but you still feel a yearning and you need to have that relationship like what Adam had with God and you need to take that next step in faith that I would invite you to enter into the community, not just of friends, but to enter into the community of faith, to accept the grace of Jesus Christ and to enter into his body, to be a part of his hands and his feet, to experience the joy of his salvation to know the joy that will make your life complete. No person alone. No person forgotten. No person without Jesus. Let this be how our community is known. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.